Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for having me today. I feel honored to be introduced by Habib, who ran the Composites Lab, and I got to know Habib before the Composite Lab was constructed. It was kind of a hole in the ground with many footings, but uh, our company, Permatry, did some work with him on composite bridge decks in New England and trying to use low-grade hardwood from Maine to save money for towns. And we did, I think, maybe a dozen of those bridges throughout New England. Habib moved on to bigger and better things, and I moved on from Permatry to the railroad division. So it's nice for us to be sort of virtually back together this morning. And it, I really appreciate the invitation to look back to even a more than a 44-year retrospective of the railroad industry in New England. Uh, what I'm going to do is we're, we're going to talk about a little before our entry into the railroad business. And at the end, we're going to talk about a lot of the investment that's been made over the, like the last 22 years. has been a massive amount of infrastructure investment in rail in New England and, and how positive that all is. And I think it's really a time where we're poised right now to take this business and really move it on to, an, to another level. My first chart here was put together by Mike Clements, who worked for me at Pan Am and now works at CSX. And he was a great person in the marketing department and also a really great strategy person. He could draw a map of any part of the railroad network of the United States pretty much on a piece of paper. So I asked Mike to put together the chronology of major New England railroads from 1976 to today. Then you'll see there's been a lot of change and a lot of different railroads, a lot of new railroads. One thing that's been meaning constant is the Vermont Railway. Dave Wolfson's railroad in Vermont has not changed really, the Green Mountain Railroad into Vermont Railway. But if you'll see the other other part of that chart, which I'm going to have up at the end of the presentation, uh, how things have really, really changed since the 1980s to today, as far as railroads go. So the early years, I like to say 76 to 81. 76, an important year for me. It was my start in the railroad business. This is a picture of Cedar Hill Yard in New Haven or North Haven. I was a 15-year-old summer trackman for Conrail that summer in, in 1976. A very interesting way to learn about the railroad industry. First off, I wasn't, I was far too young to be doing this and I had to lie about my age, but that's another story. Learning about the railroad from, from building it from the tracks. I learned a couple of things. One, I needed to stay in school because I didn't want to be running around with a spike mall all summer and winter long. It was really hard work. It was heavy work. It was tough work. The money was good. I was paid $7.65 an hour, and that was in 1976. I think the minimum age, wage was $1.30. $22 a week for travel pay, and I couldn't drive. Our mothers had to drive us to the yard. So what it taught me was go to school, get a degree, get a master's degree, and then you're going to be better off than if you're on the, on the rail gang. Another portion of the early years, which you'll call like 1976 to 1981, was the meltdown and the bankruptcy of Penn Central, the largest railroad to date uh, before that. Our company, Permatreat, which still exists today, which was built after Conrail and Amtrak needed a lot of ties to uh, fix up uh, the dilapidated Northeast Railroad in infrastructure. Our company, Guilford Rail, at that time, exploring, we explored other purchases. We explored the Grafton and Upton, which is now owned by John Deli Priscoli. It's in Massachusetts between Upton and Grafton. In Mass, Detroit, Delito, in Ironton, which is out in Michigan, and the Illinois Central Gulf. And then probably the most important thing of the early years is the deregulation of the railroad industry. And it really goes back to the Staggers Act in October of 1980. A lot of people take exception to Jimmy Carter and his presidency, but I look at Jimmy Carter's presidency. He deregulated with many other officials, including Senator Kennedy, deregulated the railroad, trucking, and aviation industry. Prior to deregulation, these industries were all controlled by the government. The Interstate Commerce Commission tr controlled all of the rates for rail and trucking. It made little sense. The companies that were regulated were making no money. They were expected to keep passenger service on. It was quite a mess. And the deregulation in the Staggers Act of 1980 helped clean that all up and position the companies today to be profit-making companies that move the country's freight. Next, we move on to assembling the network. When I say that, that's assembling the Guilford Transportation Network from 1981 to 1984. Here you can see a interesting lash up of equipment, a Maine Central locomotive, a Delaware and Hudson locomotive, and a Boston and Maine locomotive. Assembling the network, it's a very good story. It's probably worthy of a book. The first railroad that my father and at that time his business partner, Timothy Mellon, purchased, although they were looking at other railroads, as I discussed in a previous slide, was the Maine Central Railroad. And they purchased that in June of 1981. Very interesting story. The Maine Central was owned by U.S. Filter. U.S. Filter was then purchased by Ashland Oil. 
Oil. Ashland Oil is a place where my father had worked. He ran the coal division. And when Ashland Oil purchased U.S. Filter, the CEO of Ashland was a gentleman named Orrin Atkins. Uh, he was, I think they wrote a book on him. It's called The Last of the Buccaneers. And Orrin was a very interesting CEO. I think he got in a bit of legal trouble after his tenure as CEO. He saw that this U.S. Filter, which Ashland had owned, now owned a railroad. And he did not want a regulated company owned by any of his companies. That was Mr. Atkins' thoughts. So Orrin Atkins called up my father and wanted to know if he and Tim would be interested in buying the Main Central. Mr. Mellon decided to do that with my father as president, and they purchased the Main Central in June of 1981. The Boston and Maine took till June of 1983 to be purchased. I was a co-op student at that time at Northeastern University. I studied under Bob Lieb, who passed away a couple of years ago. He ran the logistics and logistics business program at Northeastern. I was a co-op student. Bob helped me get a job at the BM back in 1980. The Boston and Maine had been in bankruptcy for almost a, d- a dozen years, and it took quite a while to work through all of the federal and bankruptcy laws to get Guilford to be able to purchase it in June of 1983. Final piece of the puzzle was the Delaware and Hudson, which they purchased on January 5th of 1984. This railroad was certainly a financial laggard. They purchased it for $500,000 plus debt. The Delaware and Hudson ran quite a bit differently in the B&M and the Main Central. They still had five people running the train instead of two. And Guilford just couldn't in the long run make it economically viable. So it was it was cast into bankruptcy. Prior to that, though, was some pretty heady days at Guilford. When you look at the map of January 5, 1984, when the three systems were put together, it had quite a bit of a reach all the way to Buffalo, down to Potomac Yard in New York, Philadelphia, and Oak Island in, um, in New Jersey. The railroad was covered a pretty large swath of the Northeast and at that time had big plans to move forward. Now let's go to looking at integrating the system from 1984 to 1989. These were some pretty, I'll say, interesting times. And and I'll say everybody's subject to their own opinion on this, but there are a lot of opinions out there of the various things that happened between 84 and 89. So when Guilford came into being, one of the things that it needed to do, and this uh, Guilford, as well as other railroads, needed to do the same thing, and Conrail needed to do the same thing, was to get rid of light density branch lines. The industry had been deregulated. There was way too many tracks for the amount of business that were on it. So elimination of light density lines was important. In Maine, that would include the Mountain Division, which now with the Boston Maine and the Maine Central being one, instead of running traffic up over the Mountain Division to give it to CP up into uh, Northern New Hampshire, it would be given to the B&M and it would go all to Albany. And at that time, all the way to Buffalo, down to Potomac Yard in Washington, DC. And in, in our business, it's very important. The longer the run that you have, the more money that you can make. So eliminating the light density branch lines, another example of a light density branch line in Maine would be the Rockland branch which was ended up being sold to the state. And now many of the branch lines that we couldn't make make money in the state decided to turn, the state and other states in New England decided to turn into walking trails. I walk on some uh, when I lived in Wyndham, New Hampshire, certainly have chances to walk on ones around the seacoast and other places in the metro Boston area. Another thing we needed to do was standardize the motive power. There's no question that we had an awful lot of ragtag motive power. The short line industry is such that you really can't afford to buy new power. But what was important for us is to get one standard locomotive brand. And that, and we decided to do that back in the day and go to EMD, Electromotive Division of General Motors. And that's what we worked on doing. And we did that, quite frankly, in our head of operations. Uh, Jim Patterson, who's a gentleman that graduated from Maine Maritime and now works with Irving, he pushed to standardize to um, EMD, which he did until we had a chance to buy some GE power back in 2015. So standardize the mode of power. Then it was the proposed sale of Conrail. Conrail, um, which started in 1976, was going to be privatized. And there were some thoughts and some ideas we would and did partner with Norfolk Southern to purchase Conrail. And we had a proposal on the table that did not end up coming to fruition, but it was interesting to see where we'd go then. I'll have a map on that. Now, this obviously, this bullet is one that was very, very tough. A lot of, lot of people very upset, a lot of fights, a lot of very unhappy folks and hurt families and stuff was the two strikes we had on the railroad. When the railroads were purchased, they um, had not really come to modernizing the maintenance of way functions. And a lot of the stuff was done in a, I will say, a rather old fashioned and not very advanced and mechanized way. So there was a strike on the main central in the engineering department. That strike almost led to a national rail strike. It led to a presidential emergency board. 
as people in, learned last fall, a presidential emergency board uh, for the national railroad strike that was averted. But uh, President Reagan signed a presidential emergency board and the strike was stopped and the contract was negotiated through an act of Congress. And it led to uh, a lot less employees and a lot less business for us. And the economics were such that if we didn't have that, I don't think the railroads would have survived. Um, and it also, these strikes led to the bankruptcy of the DNH. At that time, the BNH had five people on their train crew. The BNM and the Main Central had crew contest awards, which allowed them to run two people on their crew. Five wouldn't work, two would. They tried to negotiate two, it didn't happen. And the DNH was thrown into bankruptcy. This was in a, a, a map of the possible westward expansion through Norfolk Southern and Guilford on the purchase of Conrail. Conrail ended up being sold as a private entity. And the government, which had poured billions of dollars into it, got quite a bit of it back when it was sold in a stock initial public offering back in the 80s. Let's look towards what I'll call a changing railroad landscape from 1989 to 1999. We look here, we see a lot of intermodal, which we really um, were able to get into with our partner, Norfolk Southern. These J.B. Hunt trailers, which you'll see throughout New England, move a tremendous amount of freight. And many of those uh, trailers get on to the railroad at our intermodal or uh, now the Pan Am Southern's intermodal facility at Air Massachusetts. So 89 to 90, and I'll say there was a lot of um, a lot of contention and a lot of fights that we had between ourselves and Amtrak and ourselves and possibly the state of Maine. We ended up happy with the outcomes after there was some legal cases that we worked on and won, but Amtrak had a, a fight for the Connecticut River line where they wanted us to operate on it and we no longer wanted to run passenger service on it. They took that line and they gave it to our competitor. Next was the Amtrak down Easter. Many of you know the history of that, the train from Portland to Boston. We were very concerned about Amtrak's ability to insure us if there was an accident or a small company. We're not a big class one railroad with really deep pockets. And also the cost that go along with operating Amtrak train on your railroad. Up until then, Amtrak really didn't pay the fully allocated costs. And we said that if Amtrak's going to be on our railroad, they have to pay for everything because we really didn't want them there. And we don't need to go 79 miles an hour. We're fine with going 25. So the Surface Transportation Board, which is the federal agency that kind of handles all of the issues regarding economics of the industry, the Federal Railroad Administration handles safety, STB handles economic, uh, ruled that the state of Maine would have to, and Amtrak in conjunction would have to do many of the things that we asked for. So once that was decided, we decided we're happy to run the Down Easter and we've run it now for 20 plus years up until my tenure, which ended in June of 2022. On time, very nicely taken with the people that ride it, good marketing reports. And um, I think the folks at Nepper are happy with how we ran it. We also look to shift our gateway and connection with Conrail to Worcester, and that's Barber Station, which is the technical term for where we give traffic off to Conrail at that time. The bankrupt DNH was acquired by the Canadian Pacific. And then our company had a big move out of Boston. Uh, we had a lot of customers in Boston and the land was very valuable. Many of the customers thought it would be better to be out of Boston. For example, um, Co-op Reserve was in Cambridge and the land was very expensive. They moved their operations to our industrial park at Iron Horse Park in North Belrica. Catania Spagna, a giant food oils company, moved out of Somerville to Air. The intermodal facility, which was in Boston, moved out to Air. It just was a, a lot of valuable real estate in Boston, which could be better used for something else. So folks moved out of Boston and moved up to Devons and, and into the air area. The other a problem in the 89 to 99 was the big railroads leaving New England, Canadian and National and Canadian Pacific. They exited New England. And for a time, there was no class one railroads operating in New Hampshire or Maine. That's changed. But back in this time, no one thought they'd come back, but now they're back. So, and then Conrail ended up being sold after it was its IPO. It ran for years and Stanley Crane turned it around and made it make a lot of money. Conrail was split between Norfolk Southern and the CSX. And that allowed us to have a really new and um, very fruitful partnership with Norfolk Southern. So that was a big deal and really made a big turn for one, our customers and the railroad industry in Maine and in New England. So here's a picture of CN getting out and many people will recognize this is downtown Portland, Commercial Street. And back in the 80s and early 90s, we would interchange traffic with the 
Grand Trunk Canadian National, driving the cars up the street, the half a dozen cars. They'd bring us six, we'd bring them six. Not a great way to do it. I can't imagine how you do it now with all the cruise ships are there. They moved out and sold to the folks at at Emmons, that is now uh, Genesee and Wyoming. But as bigger railroads came out, smaller railroads came in and you saw the change from class one and bigger railroads to smaller railroads, even though some of the smaller railroads did a, a great job, some quite frankly, a better job than the, than the big railroads. But Emmons came in and took over the St. Lawrence and Atlantic and rail techs, then Genesee and Wyoming came in and took over the New England Central Railroad. So this was a big change for people in New England to have new railroads that weren't really, really weren't a right around here running things. So Conrail. Conrail is split between CSX and NS. Biggest thing to happen in the industry since the bankruptcy of the Penn Central or Staggers, certainly in the East Coast. Conrail broken up between the two dominant Eastern railroads, CSX and NS. An awful lot of legal wrangling and STB to make that decision because this was going to be a you know one of the last big splits and mergers and, and what was going to happen after that. And uh, the STB did a really good job in both the companies after buying both to get the railroad as one, decided to split it up. And I think competition was helped by that. Certainly competition in New England was helped by that. So now we kind of transition after the Conrail split to, I'll say, us making our relationship better with Norfolk Southern. And as they saw what they could do here in New England, they decided to do a 50-50 joint venture with us on Pan Am Southern, which is the railroad that runs from Air to Mechanicville. It became a 50-50 joint venture and it allowed NS to put a considerably more infrastructure money into us and get more carloads on us. We built a lot of infrastructure on us. And this was one of the things I'm most proud of. And as folks in the engineering business, our freight main line, this was the last bridge we needed to go come up to 286,000 pounds. So we could go from Bangor to Buffalo at 286,000 pounds. Many of the other railroads that connect with us really still can't do that to this day. So this cost a lot of money and on the Pan Am Southern side was able to help us get there by doing this. So the Pan Am Southern, the joint venture with Norfolk Southern, air to Mechanicville and Connecticut River Lines and the branch lines included with it. We built a new intermodal and automotive terminal at Air, Massachusetts, and at Mechanicville. Tens of millions of dollars spent. We upgraded the main line to Class 3 and finished those bridges. As you saw, the last bridge in Athol, and I was the one that took that picture you saw there. We also restored interchanges with the Vermont Railroad, New England Central, the Batten Kill, Connecticut, a CNZR, which is in Connecticut, the Pioneer Valley, John Levine's Railroad, which at that time, our railroads had not even connected. The tracks were had been torn up. And that allowed John in Massachusetts to connect with us and Norfolk Southern, where before he was only able to connect with CSX. So it gave him another option. And we were able to do some good business with uh, the Pioneer Valley. On the Vermont Railroad and Dave Wolfson, when we started prior to Pan Am Southern, I think we did like seven cars one year. And then a couple of years later with propane taking off in New England, we went over to, to over 7,000 cars. And we became their largest interchange customer. So things really changed with Pan Am Southern and we were allowed to move a lot more freight for our customers. Kind of our last piece where I had much to say was our, I'll say, pivot to growth, which started in 2011 to 2020. And I think we have, a, as we move on here, pivot to growth. And when you when you think about New England and railroading, hard scrabble is the name certainly that comes to mind. And we were sitting back just before the pivot to growth saying, whoa, what are we going to do here? I mean, everyone that's in Maine has seen the number of paper mills that were there. When I came to the railroad in 1998, we had Woodland, a mill in Nocket, all know, although not on us. And that was the largest paper complex on the face of the earth with 17 paper machines. We had a paper mill at Lincoln. We had a stud mill at Cossack and a passive dump keg. We had Old Town. Uh, we had Madison. We have had Sappy. We had IPJ, Rumford, and then other, uh, other force products along the way. Those were starting to close and we were down to, and, our, and of course, our connection with Irving in St. John. But we were starting to see the paper business change as we all did. Fortunately, we didn't have a lot of newsprint that we had to deal with. But paper and forest products were really trending down. And we had two big coal plants on us, one at Mount Tom that closed. And the final one, which still is operating, but used very infrequently, is at Bow. And that plant at Bow, when I was a co-op student at Northeastern, the plant at Bow was called the mortgage lifter. And the reason it was called the mortgage lifter was because you'd get three days pay from Albany to Bow. And then took rest and then got three days pay to go back because you were paid for every hundred miles that you drove the train. And the people that were driving that train were usually in their 80s because they were making a lot of money. Sometimes I said you almost had to put the people up into the locomotive with a walker. So um, these were the senior jobs and they were making a lot of money. And, it, and most of the time we were bringing 
15 coal trains a month. They were very lucrative. The margins was very good. But we saw the writing on the wall with that. The coal was eventually going to go away. And we decided, hey, look, we need to pivot to other products. So what are we going to work on? Well, we went from coal to propane and from paper to more waste products. So propane, our marketing department led by Mike Boswick at the time, went to look at using uh, propane unloading facilities throughout our network. And we went and built a half a dozen of them in concert with the propane folks. There is no pipe that reaches to us for propane. It's at Sel Selkirk, New York. And most of the propane came in from overseas. But with fracking, propane now came from Pennsylvania and we used it here in New England. When we first started propane, when I came in the late 90s, we were doing about 500 cars a month. When we really got going, we did up to 10,000. And many of the homes and restaurants and propane that's used throughout New England comes across our railroad and is brought to your house and to your industrial facility by truck. We also moved into grain unit trains, crude oil unit trains to um, St. John, New Brunswick, and ethanol unit trains to Providence. Uh, that was a big, big um, boost for us when we got those, and it was important that, that we had them. And then we moved into Poland Spring. I look at Poland Spring. I drink it every day. Big customer of ours. We started to move it on intermodal, and um, 700 trucks a day go to New York City. It's the number one SKU in Manhattan. Um, has a new owner, and they're interested in moving more water by rail. And we started that uh, ball rolling, and we're very proud of what we were able to do on that. And then we also um, pivoted to growth, and we worked with our state and Amtrak partners once we had a nice foundation on how to run passengers on our railroad, and we're convinced that we could do it, and it would be not detrimental to our uh, balance sheet and bottom line. We expanded passenger service to Brunswick. We worked with Amtrak in the state of Massachusetts to do the Knowledge Corridor, which is from New Haven up to Vermont with John Olver, who was a congressman at the time. And we also extended passenger service in Massachusetts on Pan Am Southern to Wachusett and worked with, again, Congressman John Olver, who was chairman of Transportation Appropriations, to build a new train station and layover facility at Wachusett on our railroad. So we ran on them and they ran on us. The next thing we had to work on was a positive train control on certain pieces of the railroad, the Wachusett section, of course, we owned and had to have positive train control. And then we are a a guest across the MBTA. So we had to upgrade our locomotives to have positive train control in the cab, plus all the computer stuff back at uh, headquarters at North Bell Ricca to make sure that we had that all ready to go and the trains were operating safely. So I look at now and in the future, it's like in, in 2015, Tim started to talk about looking to Mellon, our owner, majority owner, started to look about selling the railroad and, and finding the right partner and who would who would buy the railroad and, and how we needed to do that. And he allowed us as the management team to take a long time to get set and to also try to find the right person to buy it. We had all had a lot of blood, sweat and tears involved in the company, went through a lot of tough times and a lot of great times, but it was time to think about the next generation and who would take the railroad over. So starting in 2015, we started to look at that. We kind of moved forward. We had a auction process that was managed with the folks at Bank of Montreal. And we had, I think, seven parties that were interested. And it came down to three. And at the end, we chose to be purchased by, by CSX. Quite frankly, we're honored that CSX wanted to purchase us. They're the premier United States, I'd say North American class one in any and all metrics. In the last decade, they've gone from last in class to first in class. What they bring to the railroad and our customers, which we always have to remember are the most important people we're serving, is efficiencies of single line service. So a car load that we pick up in Waterville can now go to Chicago on one railroad, making things much smoother and making things much more efficient. And they're going to invest in infrastructure at a far higher rate than we were able to uh, do. Very proud of what we did over the time that we had the railroad. The main line was at 25 miles an hour up to 79 miles an hour. Our branch lines were at 10 miles an hour. CSX are going to put the branch lines up to 25 and the main line up to 40. They've already started on a lot of that work, rebuilding the yard in Portland, which was the last piece that I didn't get to, but they're working on that right now. There will be PTC for the Downeaster, which was left out under the federal law. Now PTC will be on those trains in, in Maine and New Hampshire, which is good for safety. The deal had overwhelming shipper and political support. Maine thought it was, was, um, was great. New Hampshire thought it was great. There were some issues that had to be worked through and there was some, uh, say, tense meetings. And um, But all the things got worked out and the people that were, were unhappy, we had they, the, the folks from CSX, had negotiations with the folks and were able to come up with the agreements and, and have folks settle out and have everybody happy about what's going on. The folks at the Downeaster and Nepra 
they got a lot more stuff than they would have gotten from if, if they were still working with me, which is good for the state. And the lastly is protection for the employees. I mean, we had about a thousand employees and I had 150 managers and all those people brought us to where we were. And we wanted to make sure that in the, in the event that we were purchased by a large company, that our people would be protected. The employment things have changed with COVID and everything. So it ended up being that many people had more job offers than, than they ever thought they would have multiple job offers. But the bottom line was CSX said they're going to hire anybody that wanted a job and they've stuck with that. And the people that didn't want to go or didn't want to move, there was a um, safety net for them to make sure that they could you know, transition to a different job. So the employees were protected. The shippers are going to have transit times half of what they would have had if we continue to hold the railroad. So it's a, it was a great merger and we're very, very excited that it was consummated back in June. Let me finally talk about our what you folks are here talking about is infrastructure investment in New England. And I've come up with many, some numbers and some projects, and they've all you know started back at like 2000. But to just give everybody a, an idea of how much money's been spent, let's take a look. So infra infrastructure investment, I say into the PAR, which would be Pan Am Southern or Pan Am Railways from 2002. You know, the Down Easter at 65 million, put the Brunswick extension at 38. 2008 to 2012 was $80 million of our money on system-wide upgrades to track rolling stock and a new, and a new up refresh locomotive fleet. 2008, working with the state and the folks at SLR, we did a 5 million uh, Danville Junction rebuild. The train you saw on downtown Commercial Street, now we can bring a train up to Danville Junction, interchange it with the folks at St. Lawrence and Atlantic. They can interchange, interchange a train to us, saves our customers a day on the transit time. The Patriot Quarter Pan Am Southern project, $70 million more for the Knowledge Quarter project. We did a $3 million Western clearance project on the on the um, Pan Am Southern for bridge clearance to see about double stacks. And then I'm going to say 2021 publicly announced CSX at the surfboard, a $100 million investment in Pan Am infrastructure, quite a lot of money into a pretty small railroad. Now let's look at infrastructure investments into Massachusetts 2010 through 2023. The $255 million MBTA Fitchford line and signal track improvements, that includes the extension to Wachusett, trying to get transit times down to an hour from Fitchburg into Boston. These next three projects were CSX, MassDOT, included the Worcester Intermodal Facility, Another one that's being worked on now is the phase one of the South Coast Rail Project at 1.04 billion. Haverhill Line improvements of 17.4. Boston South Station expansion projects starting at 32.5, but we know that's going to go more than that. And then just last week, the MBTA talking about the South Side electrification project, which is really low hanging fruit. The wires are there. Really, you just need to buy electric motors for uh, the locomotives. And I think that's going to happen here in the next couple of years. Now, other New England investments, 2010 to 2023. The state of Maine, when MMA went bankrupt after that awful, terrible, tragic accident in, in Mechanic, state of Maine purchased the ex-MMA rail lines, and then they invested $10.5 and the folks at uh, Maine Eastern are, are running that, doing a great job. And then $50 million investment in the Vermont section of the Knowledge Corridor on New England Central Railroad lines. And then quite a quite a bit of money on the New Haven, Hartford, Springfield line between the state of Connecticut and the federal government. Uh, $26 million of Amtrak Ethan Allen extension into Vermont. And then $90 million starting with Canadian Pacific investment in the CMQ infrastructure going across the northern part of Maine, getting to uh, St. John, New Brunswick. So a lot of money has been invested. And I'm going to say there's going to be a lot more. And I say most of it's going to be private and not as much uh, on the federal side. So finally, we bring us back to the the major New England railroads, 76 to present. You get another chance to take a look at that line. And you know the one thing I'll say is Vermont Railroad, that's the one thing that really hasn't changed. Other than that, everybody else has changed flags, changed names, or changed ownership. But as you look to the far right, you have strong railroads with deep pockets and worldwide companies like Genesee, Wyoming, or CSX, uh, or J.D. Irving, or CP that are now have the hands of the railroad. So I think it's a great time for to be one in this business. It's going to be a great time for the customers over the next five years as everything gets rebuilt. There's going to be a lot of competition. There's going to be a lot of opportunities for jobs in this in this business. Certainly going to be a lot of interested engineering people doing a lot of these projects. So um, I'd say times are good. I thank you for listening to me for today. And I'd be happy um, uh, to answer anybody's questions. Thank you very much.